so there's no children's bulletins, but please follow along or uh, ask your mom and your dad to explain this at home, maybe as a Bible study or something. Today we're going to be looking at the qualities, excuse me, I need to, I'm, I promise I'm not on my phone. <laughs> Right. We're going to be looking at the qualities that qualify church leadership from 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, if you recall, we actually looked at this quite recently when we did Titus in January. I preached a few selected messages from there. Titus also records a list of qualities. And the list is almost identical, except uh, I think Titus adds the, uh, the quality of sound doctrine to the list. Some of you might remember my ordination council a few years ago. We had the chairs moved aside and they put me in the hot seat there in the corner and we got some pastors in and they asked me questions. Who remembers that? Who was there for that? <clears throat> okay, I'll, okay, that's great, because now I can tell you about it. <clears throat> um, we got several pastors um, in from uh, churches we fellowship with. Pastor Cal Lewis uh, was the uh, officiator and I spent uh, weeks before then preparing I had to write my own doctrinal statement from from not from scratch but in my own words it was much more difficult than than I thought it would be I did um, hours of of, um, uh, of preparation I had to write my testimony of faith it was about 16 pages that they that they um, scrutinized and they sat there and they asked me questions for three hours on my doctrine, on my moral character. Pastor David actually asked me some very probing questions, but he, he told me he would. <laughs> um, when was the last time you got drunk? Have you had alcohol since you started training for full-time ministry? Um, probing questions <laughs> the reason was because Timothy Titus records qualifications but I don't like to see it as here's um, several things that go on my CV and this qualifies me to do this job I see it as qualities because the minute that you remove one of them I become disqualified or any pastor let's speak generally today becomes disqualified you don't need to receive your degree over and over again on a yearly basis you get it once and then it qualifies you but a quality is something that you can't take away otherwise it, it becomes invalid now we did look at a lot of these qualities in detail but I want to look at it again today because it's relevant for us isn't is it not pastor David um, his last day as a pastor of this church was on Tuesday last week he's he's officially no longer with us for a whole week I, I we're still here so I think we're we're okay this church needs to be keenly aware of these next few chapters in Timothy it would be your responsibility as congregants as members of this body to make sure that there's good leadership when I did the message in Titus I spoke about um, 
that the congregation must be qualified as well to to continue to grow and to continue to seek the Lord so that when the time comes for this church to appoint a pulpit committee and do interviews and vote on your new pastor that you will be ready to do so the focus of today's message then is is why <laughs> why let's look at it together uh, I'm going reading from uh, Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 this is a true saying if a man desires the office of a bishop he desires a good work a bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife vigilant sober of good behavior given to hospitality apt to teach not given to wine no, uh, no striker, not greedy, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjugation with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report with them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy liqueur, um, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ Lord I pray that this church may be obedient and that we may hold the qualities of church leadership in high regard not compromise, not out of seeming need or, or lack, but that we may, as a church, pray for faithful leadership that meet these qualities. Amen. I'm going to speak as a third party today um, because I'm I'm a part of this church and I'm not the de facto elder uh, that's that's for another day so let me speak as a third party as a church member it says our first point is where are these qualities uh, found? And I, I just want us to um, put these things in these general categories, not spend too much detail on them because we already did. But uh, there's a few things we, we want to touch on, right? Firstly, he says, him that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. Uh, some translations use the word overseer. Um, it, it, it refers to... Um, the management uh, capacity uh, um, of of an elder um, the way that this chapter is interpreted and applied in churches vary quite dramatically um, there's there's no 
hard and fast. This is the the, the interpretation um, as we have it. Um, that's why we, we see uh, church philosophy vary so much. Um, but we're going to try our best, and uh, I'm going to sh share some things on how we're applying it here. Um, desire is a good thing, okay? Well, desire um, isn't uh, a qualification in and of itself. Um, it says a bishop must then be blameless. So it's implying that many would desire the position, especially um, uh, in the ancient time, um, even uh, here. Jewish synagogues had some sort of um, bishop or overseer um, that that functioned in this capacity and and, and, and was teaching. It's it's actually uh, it's not directly, uh, but there is a connection there. Um, the word uh, in the Greek, uh, and I found this out doing study, it was applied to the foreman of a construction crew as well I thought ah, <laughs> I, I love how um, it fits so well with the illustration that Jesus used right I will build my church and uh, and here he appoints overseers to to run the construction crew I, I, I thought that was very interesting Let's look at it. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy um, of, of gain, um, unlawful gain even, or immoral gain, um, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Um, about emotions, is the inner man uh, disciplined and under control I, I, is there signs of spiritual fruit um, that that show outwardly is there is there signs of spiritual maturity one that ruleth his own house having his children in subjugation with all gravity it says for a man um, know not how to rule his own house how shall he then take care of the church of God? That is also mentioned in Timothy, uh, in Titus. Um, and the Bible implies that the home is, is a microcosm of the church. And many of the illustrations or, or um, rather the facets of the church, because I think maybe that was first, is, um, is evident in the home. The father, <laughs> the... Um, the love between a husband and a wife, uh, scriptures say, um, it's comparable to how uh, Christ loves the church. Um, and so, uh, is your bishop a good father, a good husband? Does he apply the scriptures in his home? Does the, does the family hold them in regard? I'm not saying that um, there's a certain way uh, I'm expecting Robin to behave. Uh, she's a child. <laughs> I don't even think this implies that your children need to be believers. I don't think so. Uh, if you recall, uh, Brother Matt Stratton, he was the pastor of Gethsemane Church, um, and he had two teenage boys that were... Um, professing unbelievers and the question did come up well does that disqualify you no when they were in his house they respected and and um, remained under the authority of of their father they sat for Bible study they attended church they didn't um, speak in open rebellion um, they respected their father and mother
but they were not saved. But certainly, um, however you slice it, um, the principle is clear. And then, um, in his behavior, that's the third one, it says, um, moreover, he must be of good report of them which are without. In other words, the people that are not uh, part of the church body everyone else he he not only needs to have a good standing with his brothers and sisters in Christ but um, but to the outside world as well <coughs> I think the uh, the church especially uh, in our society today um, but maybe in every uh, part of time that the, ch that the church is scrutinized and, um, and people are quick to point out hypocrisy and that it makes the news much more so when a pastor commits a crime or is, or is found in adultery or whatever than someone else that even the unbelieving world, the people who, who, who haven't set foot in church, recognize that there needs to be consistency with what you believe and what you do. And that's one of the qualities. It says, um, not a novice, lest he be lifted up with pride. It says, um, fall into the condemnation of the devil. It's saying that you will fall into the same condemnation that condemned the devil. Pride. My position, my authority, my, my, um, my status. Look at me. <laughs> well, it is the downfall of of his rebellion and so that's a quality there has been many instances in my in my training and my in my walk where I have been humbled where I have been knocked down a few pegs um, and I'm grateful for those lessons and I hope that I never forget them Timothy goes on to talk about deacons as well. What is the office of a deacon? We don't have a lot of information on what the deacons are actually specifically supposed to do. It doesn't actually say directly the way that it does for a pastor. We looked at this earlier in chapter 4. It tells us exactly what a pastor needs to be doing. But what about the office of a deacon? Why is it mentioned here um, to have similar moral uh, qualifications or qualities? What about Acts chapter 6? This is how we're applying it here. And this is um, my understanding of scripture. In Acts 6, um, I do believe that the apostles appointed the first deacons. And what happened there was there was a, a managerial misstep. Something practically wasn't getting done properly. The widows of a certain people group um, were not getting uh, their share of the of the common food versus another people group, and the people brought their complaints to the apostles, um, and then the apostles said, "We're going to appoint 
uh, actually, he said, look out amongst yourselves. And they gave some qualities. And the qualities that the apostles said reflects the qualities here that we read in First, uh, in first Timothy. He said, let's appoint these men to sort out the issue. It had to do with food distribution. And so the job was directly wa uh, um, related to serving food, okay? There was a problem and they were charged with fixing the problem. But the Jerusalem church wasn't 50 people. It was very likely thousands upon thousands of people from the previous chapters. So these seven guys, this is just my opinion, but I don't think that they went and served every need individually. I think that part of their job was administration and management and getting people to uh, organize and to uh, motivate it and, uh, and thinking rightly about this, this practical thing, spiritual terms, and making sure it gets done. They had to have been. How, how would seven guys serve thousands? At Faith Baptist Church, the deacons hold um, a position of ad administrative leadership. Now, they're go godly men. I reach out to them for advice. Other churches might um, consider the office of a deacon uh, as more of a, of a solely, uh, please do this, or please make sure that this gets done. Um, I believe that the Bible is asking these men to take leadership in the church in, in a specific way. That's how we've applied it here at church, at FBC. Let's read some of the qualifications. The duties then, uh, it's inferred. It doesn't ever directly say, but from the example and, and from, the, um, from this passage, that they, are, that they are official servants of the church, that the pastor or the overseer and the church can rely on to make sure things get done and to solve problems and to um, to minister to the needs of the people in whatever form that might take. In Moses, um, in not in Moses, um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, counseled him. You can't do all of this by yourself. You're, you're, you're personally handling every small legal matter that is being brought to you. You're sitting here from the morning to the, to the night doing court judgments. You can't do this by yourself. You need some help. Appoint some people to do this for you. So uh, we see a pattern from Scripture that um, that fits with what Timothy is telling us, or what this letter is telling us. The qualities, then, many of the qualities are the same as the pastor. Um, it mentions the deacon's wife, which I thought was interesting. It doesn't give uh, qualifications here for the pastor's wife specifically at this church we recognize deacon families we recognize that um, 
the deacon, if the person is married, um, that there is, is unity within that, that family and that relationship and um, serving the church cannot um, not touch on the lives of, of his family and, um, and that in many capacities they serve together. Uh, when, we have, when we used to have deacons meeting in, in person, <laughs> uh, when we used to do everything in person, um, many times we would invite the whole families, not just the deacon men, um, to, to hear input and to, to... So at this church we, we give the official office to a man, but we recognize um, that he cannot actually do his job if his family is not on board. There are some uh, qualifications here. And then the blessings. You know, I've read this passage many times, but this is the first time I've actually noticed this. I read over it. Listen to this. Verse 13, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> um, churches with a hierarchical structure like, like the Catholic Church will look at this verse and say in order to become a bishop or a priest you would s first serve as a deacon and the position is, is, a, is a stepping stone to higher offices because it says you will purchase yourself to a good degree. That's what they they say. This verse is saying. Um, I, I I would disagree strongly. At this church at FBC, the office of a deacon is it's the evidence of a godly life that that the church has approved you the church has tested you it even says um, um, and let them also first be proved being found blameless we don't point anyone we, we want people who are faithful who who genuinely love the Lord who uh, who are spiritually mature who fit these 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 qualities we don't the the church doesn't need someone who's good at accounting or good at management those those qualities will always benefit the church but that's not what what we want that's not what you should be looking for, even in me. Okay, I can learn those things. Whoever is leads this church in the future, we can we can learn. Let's look at these first. But that the the office of a deacon, it, the man can can have confidence um, in his walk with the Lord. That that if the church has approved you and and called you say yes would you serve as a deacon would you uh, would you take that responsibility uh, that that is um, a mark of your godliness and it is a blessing it's not something to be feared or like oh i don't know if i can do this or the pressure um it's it's good <laughs> he's purchased himself a good degree I wanted us to look at this passage specifically and I had a hard time how do I make it relevant to you <clears throat> but I think perhaps I was overthinking it 
because like I said in my introduction it is relevant to us now the church is um, is technically without a lead pastor I am the the acting lead pastor I'm the the interim I'm doing um, a lot of what pastor David did but you as the church we will still have to cross that bridge I'm going to submit my CV to you I would love to stay I would love to be that that person but officially or technically rather this is going to be re very be very relevant very soon and I want us to be aware of this when it comes to deacons as well I've been phoning um, people regarding the future leadership of the church and not just in the deacon capacity but so many others this has been on my mind we can't go forward without good leadership and so I ask that we pray for the church in this regard that we would make wise choices and evaluate uh, godly um, men and women and I thank you for those who are serving already I don't think there's there's a person in this uh, in this room um, that that is not serving this church and I and I thank you for that as a member now you know <laughs> um, but but pl let's pray together for that and let's be aware of these qualities in the next few months Lord I thank you that you have given us clear instruction and and understandable um, guidance for our local church body that we may do due diligence that all you ask is that we be obedient to the scripture and hold it in authority things are clearer than we sometimes think we pray this in Jesus name Amen you're dismissed have a blessed day further and remember to um, sign up on the website for growth group as well the same way that you do for the Sunday service thank you Thank <laughs> you.